Hello, and welcome to the Media Center's 11th Local Hero Award series, in which we showcase six people from the Mid-Peninsula for outstanding achievement or contributions to the community. We solicited nominations and were especially looking for the unsung heroes. Each winner is an inspiration and each has a great story to tell. Marlena Tuya Sosopo is a first-generation Samoan immigrant, and she is the only Samoan woman in America who is working as an electrical engineer. Although she grew up in East Bay, steeped in the strict culture of her Samoan family, she somehow made her way to a BA from Stanford and then to USC for a graduate degree in engineering. But none of this was the reason she was nominated for this award. She is the creator of Reading Bonanza in the Park, where she organizes the day of reading, reading activities, and book giveaways in East Palo Alto every year. It's become a beloved community event that brings together local resources, parents, and children to participate in activities that encourage reading. Marlene, you grew up in a strict Samoan family in the East Bay. How different is it for a child growing up in a strict Samoan culture from life for a child growing up in a typical American household? Good question. So. I would say that there's three main differences um, that I can talk about. Uh, one is um, the different, the focus of a family. Um, so in American culture, there's this uh, individual ambition focused, where as in Samoan culture, there's a hierarchy. So you have a matai, which is basically a chief of the family um, and or the extended family. And they're the ones making all the decisions for the family. And so everybody knows their role and, and does whatever the chief tells them to. So there's this you don't have this, you know, where they're asking you your opinion, which I think is very different for American, um, from American culture. Um, no one's going to, um, you also don't talk back, um, so, uh, which I noticed was different for some of my friends growing up. Um, and there's like an internal order that's held. Um, a second main difference also, well, actually, before I talk about the same, second main difference, there's also like this, um, you know, uh, it's very tight-knit community, so um, everyone's looking out for each other. It's like, you know, you have a, like a, a village raising a child, right? And so, like, mm -hmm. that's what I mean with the internal correcting. Um, so another main difference is uh, Christianity. So uh, Christ Christianity is very integrated into the Samoan culture. So um, everyone's definitely going to be in church on Sunday. Uh, we actually have a daily um, Bible prayer and, or Bible study and prayer. So, um, like, it, you don't, you know, we're not going to answer any phones. Everything shuts down for that for that hour or so that you're, and it's every day. In the evening, um, and I would say the third difference is um, that I want to talk about is um, like there's I would call it a culture of of no fear. So, um, and I believe it comes from the fact that when you're uh, a Samoan, you're representing not just yourself, but also your family, your elders, um, where you're from. Um, and uh, one of the best examples of that is my grandmother, who's um, the high chief of my family, and uh, her name is Nofualuma Lelie Yao and Asi Fulu to Asasobo. So right there you can see that she's already carrying a lot of the family names. Um, but she was the perfect example of no fear. She immigrated here in the 70s um, and she saw that a lot of Samoans struggling um, living in um, like the projects in San Francisco. And so she did a lot of, uh, she founded a, a church uh, or helped found a church and she started a nonprofit, uh, founded a nonprofit called Samomo Samoa. And they uh, housed and clothed and got jobs for thousands of Samoans and other minorities. And um, the other um, great thing that she did was um, she petitioned in Washington, D.C. So, you know, she wasn't afraid to go talk to, even though she had very limited English, she wasn't afraid to, she would be in City Hall all the time talking to the mayors, mm -hmm. the senators. Um, she went to Washington, D.C. and petitioned to get Samoa on the U.S. Census for the first time um, in 1980. And so, because um, we're always categorized as Asian when our plights are totally different, so. So, it's interesting you talk about no fear, and yet there's a role, there's violence. Tell me about the role of violence in Samoan families and what you personally have experienced. Yeah, so I would um, say this is a, a topic that's only 
been more recently accepted to talk about, you know, in um, our culture. And I, I would say that it starts off first as, um, you know, discipline for the child. So, um, you know, everyone's supposed to know their role. And, you know, most in, in the Samoan family or culture, the kids do most of the work. And then the, you know, older ones tell them what to do. And so um, um, I also, it, I think it stems from, like, uh, the history of, uh, colonialism and mm -hmm. actually um, missionaries that came to Samoa and um, you know kind of brought Christianity in the 1700s 1800s and um, so there's this uh, a facade that a lot of uh, Samoan families um, like to have to to um, show that they're good and perfect and but you know so most kids right you know they if they act and out they're they're you know um, going to get extreme discipline and um, so um, I would say that um, it starts off that. So that can prov you know, create some really great high achieving Samoans like it did for me. Or um, on the other hand, there's other effects like um, children resorting to alcohol and drugs and uh, gangs and um, even suicide. So uh, most people don't realize, but uh, Samoa has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Wow. And, um, and it's and that's one of the effects. Another effect is uh, domestic violence. You know, when you're not able to express emotions, it, it's bottled up, and then it comes out in other forms. So, so you were subjected to what you now know as domestic violence. And in fact, even though you were a good student, a good ki kid, you got kicked out of your own house. <laughs> yeah. So how did that happen? Okay. So I um, yeah I basically got kicked out because I was disobedient to my my father was. Uh, the disciplinary in my family. But you were disobedient in a pretty darn good way. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So, um, you know, there's a different focus, like in, I was mentioning earlier, um, there wasn't a focus of my school. I was supposed to do my chores at home and, you know, do the things that needed to get taken care of at home. And so, like, I would have to actually pretend like I was sleeping to do my homework. And, um, you know, th so that's, there wasn't, like, a focus. And so when I, I was a senior and I got it, you know, I told my father that I, I got it to Stanford. Um, I don't think he really understood the significance of that, and so it wasn't like a priority for him. Also, I mean, I, I was get, I had a 4.4 GPA. I did uh, basketball, volleyball, softball. I was doing community service. Um, I did a lot of things. I was in a lot of clubs, uh, leadership in my school. Um, however, um, since like 13 years old, I was drinking alcohol and going to uh, nightclubs since I was 15 years old. So, you know, there's other things that I was doing. I also had, like, uh, my best friend. I would go to their house, like, every night, and, or as often as I could because I didn't like the violence that I would see at home. I'd try to be away from my family or my, my, my family's home as often as I could. So it was a number of things where I went to a softball tournament, which is on a Sunday, which I never missed church, and um, hanging out with uh, my best friend one night. So those are a couple things that caused me to get kicked out, and I ended up uh, staying with my best friend's mother, my family. So in a sense, you got kicked out for studying and doing after school sports and all the things that typical Americans want their kids to do. Yeah. You finally got to Stanford. Um, what do you think m makes the difference between those who, not very many, have gone to Stanford, for example, which is kind of the, the pinnacle of uh, American values, those who do and those who don't? What do you, why you? Why did you? Why did that happen for you? Why was I able to go to Stanford? Yeah, why were you able to get there? out or to break away from the culture to that extent? I actually am, um, you know, there was something I remember um, that taught me that for some reason I knew that college was my ticket out. Like I hated growing up the way I grew up, like poor and not having, um, not being able to do a lot of the things that I would see on TV and things like that. So, but I, I, um, I, there's some messages that I, either my friends or, Somebody told me that college was a way out, and so that's I put a lot of my effort into my schoolwork. So even though I was, you know, hanging out and doing things for for fun that probably would not get most people into Stanford, I also made sure that my academics were on point to make sure that I had a, you know, a good chance to get in a great school. Yeah. So you get in. Was it like great relief, easy going? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> in a way, it's a relief. I mean, I um, that meant I had somewhere to live, right? Because mm -hmm. I got kicked out. I didn't have a, a home to go to. So, um, uh, 
in that way, there's relief also was free because we were um, mm -hmm. low income. So, um, you know, um, financial aid took care of the tuition and room and board. But um, there was a big culture shock. I never seen so many Asians and whites in, in my life, like in one place, right? Because it was uh, mostly minority where I grew up, minority eth uh -huh. ethnicity. So, <clears throat> yeah, that was a big culture shock. I also felt that I was a, a ghetto girl. Like, um, I didn't, at that time, I didn't barely, I could barely um, complete, you know, formulate complete sentences. Um, so I didn't feel comfortable even, and also just um, s seeing kind of like the, the belief system that some of the my students had. They they were starting companies. This was like, you know, 98 where a dot com boom happened. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was starting some kind of company. And so this was just very foreign to me and made me very, very uncomfortable. Um, but it was something that, um, you know, I was I had to learn and luckily I did because uh, now I, I have a, a a high belief system in in, my, hmm. in what I can do. Hmm. Well, a lot of um, a lot of the turning points in your life seem well by your own description to have been um, pure luck or serendipity. For example, electrical engineering, an unlikely thing for a a woman, b a Samoan. How did that happen? Yeah, so somebody told me that people that like math do engineering, and because I never heard of an engineer before Stanford, and so I was um, I applied as an engineering undeclared, and so they put me into this advisory group, and I had an advisor, uh, Dr. Sherry Shepard. She's a mechanical engineer, engineering professor at Stanford, and she basically gave me um, one and two sentence description of each of the different le engineering, and the only one that piqued my interest was this, uh, you know, a couple sentence description of, of electrical engineering of uh, basically, you know, there's radar where you have a signal and uh, there's a message in that signal and you have to decode it. And that just like, oh, that sounds really interesting. And come to find out that actually what, um, even though I took all the different classes in electrical engineering, that one uh, piqued my interest so much that, I mean, it was, it's really math based. So um, I, uh, and that I actually work as a wireless applications engineer now and dealing with signals all day. So, <laughs> so all based on that, just so one, conversation, on that one conversation, that one description. Yeah. And actually, there is a, um, a website that allowed me to declare as a freshman um, electrical engineering. And then there's a button underneath it that said undeclare. So I thought I would be, you know, have a little fun. And I declared electrical engineering. And then I, um, you know, when I went to try to undeclare there was a message saying um, must see department to perform right. action and and at the time I was too intimidated to talk to the electrical engineering department so I just went with so it, it was and decided for you but luckily yeah. like you said serendipity it worked out and uh, I'm very happy as in my profession as an engineer what about um, it, it does sound like eventually you warmed to Stanford and Stanford certainly warmed to you when you got over the shock value what about Stanford opened your eyes or changed your world view? Yeah, so um, I kind of mentioned it a, a little earlier with, um, you know, uh, the belief system that some of my cl classmates have of, you know, they were starting companies. Like I took a, my first CS class, a computer science class, and um, a couple of my classmates, they went on right after that class and started a company. And that just like blew my mind, like that the audacity that they had to just do something like that, you know, and because um, I didn't know anybody that started a company, so um, it was just getting used to that whole belief system that you could do something, you could start something, you could be a leader, you can start your own company um, and make good money off of it was just like so eye-opening for me. And also, you know, the professors they talked to us as though we were, you know, world leaders. We were gonna uh, be starting these companies, and so this. This whole expectation was just something that I never um, had for myself growing up. I mean, the teachers didn't speak like that to us in Hayward, you know. Well, and, and this <laughs> does sound like a, in yeah. complete contrast to the Simone culture in the family. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So, like, there's it, that was a big part of the the thing that I had to adjust to. It was just, you know, having some kind of individual ambition. Like, I, mm -hmm. what can I do and what am I going to achieve? And that was just something new for me, for sure. Now, after you got your master's degree, you went through um, probably some more difficult searching times um, that resulted in, um, if not a conversion, a, a different take on Christianity. Sure. 
Tell me about that. What was what's the before? What what was the after? What did you learn? Yeah. So growing up, I always saw the Ten Commandments as like a list of rules of things that you know that would make me feel bad, basically about myself, because you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. Some of those things I actually like I had to do to survive in where I grew up. Um, I was stealing, and you know, I kind of felt justified. I didn't have to do that, but. I felt justified in doing it because you know my parents were working so hard and we never had money to buy anything so I was doing that and then but that brought a lot of shame to me and I, I knew it was wrong and so I just kind of carried a lot of uh, guilt and shame and um, then somebody brought the verse to me um, you know John the one a lot of people know is John 3 16 and if you look at the first part of that it says for God so loved the world it doesn't say God loved only the good people or the people that are you know and so that really opened up my eyes. And um, actually, the Bible talks about how there are no good people. And so, um, every, you know, when I realized that, um, you know, um, it, it was possible that God could love me, despite, you know, I, um, I think the it wasn't it was very conditional the type of love that I received at home. And so um, I couldn't imagine that somebody with even higher authority could love somebody despite all their flaws. And so, but once I, I um, realized um, some things, I was, um, you know, I, there was a turning point, I think, where I realized, like, the more that I just kind of submitted to whatever God wanted me to do, then the more, like, the good things were happening in my life. And, you know, even though I was achieving, like, there's still a lot of, like, internal pain that you can go through. But until, like, I was actually really dedicated to uh, doing what God wants me to do, um, and I think it was a way for him to show me that, you know, the Ten Commandments are not this list of things to, that you have to, like, you know, fall in order, but it's more just to show you, like, a life that you should live. Mm -hmm. So now I live in a life where I don't have to lie, I don't have to steal, I don't even desire to do that. But, um, and it's because that's the kind of life that he wanted for me. In, you know, Jeremiah 29, it talks about God wants the best for you, he wants to prosper you. And I never um, kind of understood that until, until I it, it sounds more study. Like, it, it, it just sounds like a, a level of self-acceptance that that had not been for sure yeah I think when you um, like when you have this belief that you know your creator loves you there's just it really grounds your soul and mm -hmm. you know there's something about that when you don't have to worry that th there's this being out there that you know that wants the worst for you he actually wants the best for you and and so you can walk around and not have to worry about and carry this fear or shame so you had said when we first met that um, you walked the dish behind Stanford having conversations with God, and um, <laughs> out right. of it came the reading project, yeah. it, 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 which is a little bit of a surprise. It wasn't a project uh, to give back in terms of Samoans, electrical engineering. Reading, where did that come from? Yeah, good question. So, yeah, I, you know, I was single at the time, and, you know, when you're single, you have a lot of distractions, and... I was kind of getting to know God at that point, and um, so I was. There's a Stanford Day of Service where um, they're encouraging, you know, the alumni department tries to encourage all the alumni to give back to the community somehow. And so at the time I was single, you know, had free time. I figured I'm able-bodied. Why not, right? My, especially because with all the stuff my grandmother did. So I, um, I, I was trying to think about what actually allowed me to go to a school like Stanford, where a lot of my peers didn't even graduate high school. And I remember my mother took me to the library often when I was young. And so that's where I fell in love with books and I could read at a young age. And so, um, and I think that was the, you know, before I went to kindergarten, I could read. And I think that was the key difference that allowed me to always do well in school and then, you know, do well um, academically. So, um, or, you know, professionally. So I think, um, so, th so I, I had this vague idea of reading to kids in a park and, you know, just to bring awareness, and then I brought it to a nonprofit in East Palo Alto called Youth EPA, and you know, the teenagers there kind of like said, "Oh yeah, but you have to have activities, and you have to make it fun, and then you got to give giveaways to give them as an incentive to actually participate in the activities." And so it just became this great, like, huge event. And um, so, um, yeah. What What are some of the highlights? So what are some, some of the highlights. things that people like? The What are the top three things that draw people? Sure. So. Um, this past year, we gave, it's a big book giveaway and activities fair. So this past year, we gave away 7,500 books to almost 700 youth. And we, um, uh, there's 52 organizations that came out and hosted activities. So there's a component of the book giveaway, and then there's also these um, activities to show kids how, 
how reading can be fun. It doesn't need to be in a library, you're just sitting. But, you know, we're doing little activities for the kids, for the babies, toddlers, um, young kids, phonics, games, like relay races with letters, just totally random, different fun things. Um, and one of the couple big things that we have uh, is the, there's a read aloud tent. So uh, this past year we had a read aloud tent that was a big hit and basically we are sharing, um, you know, some, uh, you know, um, tips on how to read aloud to your children. For the parents. For yeah. the parents. You know, some parents uh, don't realize that um, it's really important to read aloud to your children. There's a time to engage with your child and you, could, you should do it all the way up into high school and it could be a, a time where you can just bond with your child. And the other big um, activity we have is the spelling bee. So we have a, a spelling bee for high schoolers and for middle schoolers, and we give away Mac laptops to the winners. When, when you look at, at um, when you observe, what are, well, tell me about a moment or two that has either surprised you or made you just wowed. Yeah, so there's a, um, so many things that happen that encourage me to do the event every year. Um, so one of the... Um, things that happened this past year. There was a, a winner of one of the activities and she, she won a, whack, a Mac laptop. And her mother, um, she you know, came up to me and told me how, how much she appreciated it and it was just really encouraging. And so I was just engaging with her. I, I wanted to know, you know like what her situation was and she told me that she just lost her job a couple months ago and um, she worked as a bus driver. And come to find out, I actually knew somebody that owned a transportation company in my church and I didn't make any promises but I said there's a good chance and um, that week she got hired and it wasn't that she wasn't qualified she was very well qualified because it was exactly the same um, like type of route that she was doing for a previous company and they were really looking for somebody so it was just you know they had a need she had a need and we were able to to match it but it was only because you know we were out there engaging in the community and, and fellowshipping with the, with one another right and so that's just one example, but um, as it relates to books, there's um, parents that were really surprised that their how how much their children enjoyed like the read aloud, um, and how like they were so into the book. Um, that really was an eye opener for some parents. Um, also, there was a one um, gentleman who came up to me and said he didn't realize how much his daughter loved books because she would not even do any of the activities, and because she was afraid that somebody would take her books. So she just sat there the whole time just holding on to her books and she didn't want to leave them alone. And he did, had no idea that she was into books like that. And so I think, you know, once you have this, you show kids what they could do and have a an high expectation for them, they're going to they're gonna rise to that occasion. We're almost out of time, but I want to ask what, what this gives you. You're, you're looking at this event, this baby that you created. What does it do for you at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, um, anybody that does community service, I think, you know, you it warms your heart and, you know, your heart just grows bigger and just wants to give more. And, um, you know, I am I learn from the community. I enjoy spending time in the community. You know, there's, there's people that are struggling in these low-income communities, which is just very similar to the community I grew up in. Um, but a lot of it is just like, you know, connecting and getting to know each other and, you never know like what kind of bosom buddy you can have just by you know talking and 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 spending time in community. Great. We'll keep we'll keep opening that heart and and expanding it and yeah. uh, keep up the good work. Thank and, you so much. Uh, thanks for coming and congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, for having me. Do you know someone who has overcome significant hardship and has an inspiring story to tell? Someone who has sacrificed or given over and above to the community and deserves some recognition. If so, please contact us with your nomination for next year's Local Hero Awards. To find out more about our local heroes and to watch interviews with all of the winners, visit our website, midpenmedia.org. At the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center, you can make your own videos and television programs and take classes in all aspects of media production. You can also hire our professional services team. To find out more about that, go to mcproservices.com. Congratulations to all our winners, and thank you for watching.